I want to tell you a story. In the 1990s, Tanzania undertook a national campaign to promote family planning. As part of it, the government tried something called entertainment education. They broadcast a radio soap opera with storylines about sexual health called Twende Nawakati. There are seven media markets in Tanzania. Twende was broadcast in six of them. But as an experiment, it was not aired in Dodoma, which is surrounded by mountains. Here's what happened. At the start of the experiment, in 1993, 26% of married women in those six markets said they used family planning. After two years of the campaign, including Twende, that rose to 33%. After two more years, it reached 37%. In Dodoma, where Twende was not part of the campaign, 51% said they used family planning in 1993. Two years later, it had fallen to 46%. So at that point, the government added Twende to the campaign in Dodoma. Two years later, the use of family planning there had risen to 64%. Another story. The CDC runs a national STD and AIDS hotline. To prompt calls, the CDC often partners with networks to air public service announcements, PSAs. In 2001, those PSAs ran on outlets like MTV, the Black Entertainment Network, BET, and a soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful. That year, collaborating with CDC scientists, the show introduced an HIV-AIDS subplot. On one episode, viewers saw Tony learn he was HIV positive. On another, he tells his fiancée. Tony, what was the test for? HIV. <laughs> I'm HIV positive. Here's what happened to hotline calls during the year. Here, 60 Minutes runs an HIV-AIDS segment, but not the hotline number. Here, some networks air a PSA with the Surgeon General and the 800 number. On National HIV Testing Day, BET airs a hotline PSA. On World AIDS Day, MTV airs two specials with PSAs. On August 3rd, Tony tests positive and the actor appears in character in a PSA. On August 13th, Tony tells his fiance the PSA runs again and the hotline gets the most calls of the year. In 2012, some of my colleagues at USC, supported by an NIH grant, wrote and produced two short films each in Spanish and English, that encourage women to get pap tests. One of the movies the filmmakers describe as a non-narrative, the other a narrative. Here's a short clip from the non-narrative, It's Time. Hi. We're here to, to do your uh, pap test today. Having it the first time, you know, it's um, something, you know, you feel uncomfortable because you, you, you know, you think somebody's gonna be looking down there. So we'll just do that quickly. Let down for me. All right, then we, all right. All right, come on, and come all the way to the, to the end of the table. That's good, all the way, that's good, okay. And now the speculum, this is what it looks like, just to open it, and this, this is just lubricant to make sure that it goes okay. All right, here it goes. All right, let me see. Now you're gonna feel the brush. And we're just gonna take some samples of your cervix. That's all we're gonna do. So here it goes. Just gonna move it a few times. It is a little painful, but um, a little pinch might be worth um, saving your life. 
And here's a clip from the narrative, Tamale Lesson. Does it hurt? Um, no, not really. Just like a mosquito bite like this. Ow. <laughs> it's Ow. embarrassing. And it's probably uncomfortable. No, it's more like this. Okay, when you go to the doctor, you sit on the table and they spread your legs like this. I stop. And what exactly does the doctor do? Okay, so let's pretend this is your vagina. It's not that color. Petra, just pretend. Okay, I'm a tamal. So the doctor has like this device, this metal device. They just spread the walls of your vagina. I don't say words like that. Petra, you never had this test done before? It's not as bad as it looks. Mira, mira. They take this mascara type wand and then they just wipe you on the inside. Like that. Yeah. They take a little sample of yourselves. They did pre- and post-tests on 758 women. Their findings? Viewers of the narrative learned significantly more facts about pap tests than viewers of the non-narrative. Viewers of the non-narrative didn't change their attitudes toward pap tests, but viewers of the narrative became more supportive of pap tests. Stories are powerful, but the consequences of that power are not always desirable. The first social scientist to observe this was Plato. In the Republic, Plato prescribes the curriculum for the future guardians of the state. He lays out what the young elite of Athens should study arithmetic, geometry, solids in motion, astronomy, dialectic. There's just one problem with the curriculum, competition, from outside the academy. The problem, the competition, is poetry. Now, you need to know that the Homeric bards were the rock stars of ancient Greece. Tens of thousands were enthralled, enchanted, spellbound, by their performances. And that, Plato warns, is dangerous. Poetry inflames feelings. It makes things up. It's anti-science. It's sorcery. It's a counter-curriculum, Plato says, and we can't help succumbing to it. Poetry has direct access to our physiology. It end-runs our reason. It makes us laugh, cry, moan, shout, cower, startle, whether we want to or not. Intellectual resistance is futile. You can't beat poetry with geometry. And so, in the tenth book of the Republic, Plato notoriously banishes the poets. If we don't want our appetites to enthrall us, if we want science to rule, then Plato says the only recourse is to exile the storytellers. But democracies don't do that. Do you know the show 24? Torture as a tool. It's used often and effectively in the Fox TV counterterrorism drama 24. Force me cease. That's 24's good guy torturing his own brother. Jack Bauer, the tough, sensitive undercover operative, justifies his actions to save America from Islamic extremists who have just detonated a nuclear bomb in Los Angeles. The United States military is concerned about it because uh, they've started receiving evidence that soldiers in the field have been impacted by it downrange in Iraq, utilizing uh, techniques which they've seen on 24 and then taking them into a environment in the interrogation booth. In 2006, the dean of West Point was so alarmed by the adverse effect of 24 on the training and performance of real American soldiers that he traveled to Hollywood to tell its writers and producers that the show was more influential on his cadets than their teachers and textbooks and promoted unethical and illegal behavior. The kids see it and say, if torture is wrong, what about 24? 
He pleaded with 24's makers to use their power more responsibly. Their reply, in effect, was that 24 is only entertainment. Did 24 intend to instruct our soldiers? Maybe not. But today, there are whole industries that bank on the power of narrative to enchant us. And then he said something else. Requip. He said Requip would help relieve those RLS symptoms that were making my nights so difficult. He told me what to watch for, that Requip may cause you to fall asleep or feel very sleepy during normal activities such as driving, or to faint or feel dizzy when you stand up. Tell your doctor if you experience these problems or if you drink alcohol or are taking medicines that make you drowsy. Also, tell your doctor if you experience new or increased gambling, sexual or other intense urges while taking Requip. Side effects may include nausea, drowsiness, vomiting, and dizziness. Thanks to Requip, the RLS mystery is not keeping me up anymore. In Dan Kahneman's terms, System 2 hears the risks, but System 1 gets there first and loves the story, the music, the lady, the chaise, the plants, the puzzle, the happy ending. It's not only entertainment. In some hands, it's a weapon. If the marketers of pharmaceuticals to consumers can combat data with a counter-narrative, so can the marketers of anti-science to citizens beat evidence with infotainment, with disinfotainment. If scientists were entertainers, Here's how they might handle this. Before we begin, on, in the interest of mathematical balance, I'm going to bring out two people who agree with you, climate skeptic, and Bill Nye, I'm also going to bring out 96 other scientists. <laughs> uh, it's a little unwieldy, but this is the only way you can actually have a representative discussion. Scientists are not entertainers. I know that. But like it or not, every scientific communication with the public exists in the same sphere of discourse as the circus of false narratives. Communicating what science is, how science knows, and what it has learned, there are high stakes in getting this right. To do that, why not take advantage of the applied science of storytelling. You can't beat sorcery with arithmetic. Don't bring a data set to a food fight. Bring stories. Frank Danielle was USC's first film school dean and a legendary screenwriting teacher. He warned his students about what he called the forbidden pattern, the monotony of and then, and then, and then. That's not a story. It's boring. It loses people. Stories, Danielle said, follow a different pattern. And then, but, therefore. That's dramatic. That's how stories hold our attention. Here's how Trey Parker, co-creator of South Park and the Book of Mormon, put it. And I so, sort of always call it the rule of replacing ands with either buts or therefores. And so it's always like, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. Whenever I can go back in the writing and change that to, this happens, therefore this happens, but this happens. <laughs> Whenever you can replace your ands with buts or therefores, it makes for better, right? Randy Olson, in Science, calls it the universal narrative template. This is the problem that a lot of scientists run into when they try and give presentations. I know, I was a scientist, I've listened to a million of these talks. They never get out of exposition mode. They never begin a story. They will tell you, here's our data, and here's a graph, and here's another graph, and here's another graph, and here's another graph, and here's our conclusions. And that's okay, it's nice and clear, but it's not as powerful as if they were to reach into story mode and put things together with a narrative structure. The scientific enterprise is dramatic to its core. The scientific method is inherently an and, but, therefore story. We thought that this and this and this were true, but then we found that. Therefore, now we think something else is true. 
science is the story of doing science. This is an important moment to be telling that story.